From nuclear bombs to infinite hit points to immunity to all damage, these are strategies so powerful they're banned in D&D. D&D is not a very balanced game, but if you're playing with friends, who cares? You just make up a house rule. But what happens if you're playing with people you don't know? Introducing West March D&D servers, communities of thousands of players and GMs where anybody can hop in and find a game. It's practically utopian, but there's a problem. If you're playing with strangers and anyone can join, how do you stop little Jimmy, who's just downed six cans of Red Bull and binged 100 D&D shorts from wrecking the game. The answer is bans. The following strategies are so powerful they're banned in, for want of a better word, official D&D servers. The strategies we're talking about today are banned on the Forged Concordance Discord server, and we're ranking each one on the Powermatic from the least to the most ridiculously broken. So to start off, what's the most powerful spell in the game? It's Wish, right? Wish can replicate any other spell as an action, even if it normally costs eight hours to cast. But this banned strategy pulls off that exact same trick with an item as low as Uncommon Rarity. The idea is to be a wizard or bard and use a spell gem. This is an item a bit like a ring of spell storing, but it only holds one spell. But the upside is, no matter what spell you store inside the gem, a creature holding it can use one action to cast that spell. That is one action, and you can cast a spell that might normally take 10 minutes or 10 hours. It doesn't matter. This is busted. Tiny Hut is a spell that creates a dome of force around you and eight others. Anyone outside the radius of that dome can't enter, and the spellcaster can't leave, but anyone else inside the radius of the spell when you cast it can exit and enter freely. Did you ever play tag and there was that one kid who was like, you can't touch me, I'm in the safe zone. This is basically that. Players can jump in and out of what is essentially a one-way wall of force, throwing off attacks and then retreating back to safety. Oh, and by the way, this lasts for eight hours with no concentration. It is designed for enabling long rests. It is absolutely not designed to be thrown out mid-combat at the cost of only a third level spell slot. Glyph of Warding is another third level spell that normally takes an hour to cast, but is really powerful if you can drop it as an action. This strategy just gets more powerful the higher level spell gems that you have. Spells with long casting times are like that for a reason. Tiny Hut and Glyph of Warding are both banned for use with spell gems. On the power matic this probably gets like a 3 out of 10. Sure, it's strong, but we've got a long way to go. So the average movement speed in D&D is 30 feet. Monks can bump that up to 50 by level 10, but what if you had 50 foot of movement speed at level 1 and you were immune to every melee attack in the game? This is the power of the Aarakocra. Yeah, we all know that fly speed is kind of busted in D&D. You can just hover out of range of enemies' attacks. A level one Owling Cleric can single-handedly kill a Tarrasque. But even against enemies who have ranged attacks, flight goes crazy with just a tiny bit of optimization. The spell Sniper Feet can double the range of your Eldritch Blast, throw on Eldritch Spear, and you can knock out enemies from 600 feet in the air. No enemy in the game has the range to compete. The Forged Concordance has an interesting ban here though. Instead of removing flight from player races completely, it's just nerfed. Every flying race in the game starts with a fly speed of 15 feet, and it stays that way until you reach level four. From level four, it increases by five feet per level, capping out at your walking speed. I like this one because fly speed is only really overpowered in the early game. And this doesn't ban flying races altogether, it just nerfs them in combat for those first few levels. This is a good compromise on fly speed that I think a lot of tables could use, because let's face it, flying speed is kind of unstoppable for an unsuspecting new GM, especially in the early game. But what about nukes though? The bag of holding nuke is kind of famous now. Rules as written, when an extra dimensional space, like a bag of holding, enters another extra dimensional space, like another bag of holding, they tear a hole in the fabric of reality and blow up. It creates a black hole vortex that sucks in everything within 10 feet of it. It doesn't matter if it's the Tarrasque, 
Tiamat, the Demogorgon, the kids at the orphanage down the road, nothing can escape, there is no saving throw. I've already made a video about how a level 2 Artificer can completely alone abuse this feature to one-shot any creature in the game. Some creative folks have even crafted weapons that are designed to fire these bag of holding nukes at a range of hundreds of feet. This is obviously nuts, but bear in mind, it doesn't actually kill a creature, it just banishes them to the astral plane, so that does bring it down on the power o -matic. Still, if that creature can't plane shift, it is still very much removing the problem. The fix for this feature is to just tweak how the interaction works. Instead of exploding, now when two bags of holding meet each other, they just scatter their contents on the astral plane. There is no black hole. Yes, it's less cool, but yes, it's less broken. It's nearly Valentine's Day, and you know what that means. Time to hunt men for sport. Ten lucky viewers will be captured, shaved, oiled, and deposited naked into the hunting ground. And we have some beautiful hunting grounds this year, courtesy of Che Peku maps, like Hell's Tax Office, The Beached Kraken, or Inside The Beached Kraken. The perfect battle maps to bring your campaigns to life and your players slash victims to death. Oh, and by the way, you get every map they've ever made. 4,000 plus maps for just $5. I could try to be funny about this, but it's not a joke. $5 for over 4,000 of the best quality TTRPG maps ever made. Che Peku maps are the maps I used for Ryoko's Guide. That's the book that I made. I insisted that we get Che Peku because I seriously think they're the best. Just swing by Che Peku on Patreon, link in description, and bring your games to life with settings that inspire and terrify. Check it out, and I'll see 10 lucky viewers in the hunting pits very soon. Okay, so in D&D, one of the core balance systems is that you can only attune to three magic items. But also in D&D, you can summon creatures. Spells like Find Familiar give you a permanent companion and an extra body on the board. Now, their stats are garbage and they can't attack, but they can attune to items. So can NPCs. You can hire a bodyguard for a day and kit them out with magic stuff. Here's the strategy. You get a ring of spell storing and you give it to your NPC companion. They can now use an action to cast the spells within. This weak familiar slash NPC just became a walking missile silo. There are just hundreds of magic items you can get your familiar to attune to that crack this game like an egg. Armor of the Fallen, the various guild signets, even cool items with downsides like the earworm don't have downsides when it's not you who's attuning to them. And by the way, those are just the uncommon items. At higher rarities, this is wild. It's unbelievable. This strategy ranges from okay to completely unstoppable, depending on the power level of items available in your game. But the truth is, no matter what, attunement slots are there for a reason. This is a loophole to get around that limit, and it massively boosts the power of NPCs and familiars. So in maybe the most sensible change in history, the restriction here is that any companion you summon or companion that you hire shares your attunement slots. It makes sense. In a high magic late game setting, this is wild. Yes, magic items really are that powerful. Okay, so forget companions. You can't trust them anyway. How about infinite copies of yourself? Yes, it's the classic simulacrum loop, the first YouTube short I ever made. The gimmick works by being a spellcaster with at least two spell slots of 7th level or above and casting simulacrum on yourself. This creates a copy of you with all your known spells and all your remaining spell slots. Sure, there are limits here. The simulacrum can't gain levels or regain expended spell slots, and if you ever cast simulacrum again, the current one dies. But that doesn't matter. You just need to take Take a long rest, and the following day, order your simulacrum to cast simulacrum on you. Your simulacrum has now made another copy of you at full strength, and now that copy can make a copy of you, and so on 
and so on forever. This is already an infinite army of high-level spellcasters, but if you do this after obtaining the Wish spell, you become literally the most powerful being in the universe. Not only can you order the Simulacrums to cast Wish to get you various things, like the money to keep casting Simulacrum, but because they're the ones casting Wish, not you, you're inured to the negative effects of it. Usually, Wish comes with a risk of not being able to cast it again, but it doesn't matter, because your Simulacrums only have one ninth level spell slot anyway. Each clone you create can cast Wish once, and you can use those Wishes to raise your stats to infinity or grant yourself immunity to every damaging source in the game. And because every new Simulacrum will be a copy of you, your Simulacrum army will copy those buffs as well. Obviously, this is broken. It is wildly overpowered, but it does lose points on the Paramatic for being only doable from level 17. The ban for this one is very simple. Simulacrums can't cast Simulacrum. So that whole immunity to damage thing sounds pretty cool. Wouldn't it be nice if there was a way to do that from level 1? Well, there is. Lycanthropy is all you need to be immune to bludgeoning, slashing, and piercing damage from non-magical, non-silvered weapons. Let's say you accidentally contract werebear lycanthropy. Bada bing. You now have a 40 foot walk speed, a 30 foot climb speed, the damage immunities, your strength score jumps up to 19, you get a plus one to your AC when you're in your hybrid or bear form, and you have access to every action in the wear bear stat block. You're also not evil, by the way. Werebears are neutral good beings. Sure, you will lose control of your body over the full moon, but you're just turning into a neutral good bear. How is that a curse? You're adorable. You can even self-inflict lycanthropy with the magic item Blood of the Lycanthrope. That's all of those buffs on demand. Then, when you're done using the features of lycanthropy, just harvest a little bit of your blood for the next time you want to inflict yourself with it and cast remove curse. Boom. Lycanthropy on tap. It is a furry's dream. Look, the truth is, despite being called a curse, lycanthropy is pure upside if you manage it intelligently. Obviously, it needs to be banned. The Forged Concordance tag players who are cursed with the sickly boys tag, and the restriction is pretty simple. While you're cursed, you can't go on adventures. You literally have to stop the game until your curse is cured. It makes sense. Werebears are kind of busted, and there is no level restriction on this combo. Okay, two combos left, and in case you haven't noticed, we're getting pretty out there in terms of exploiting this poor, Poor game. This next ban prevents dozens of busted interactions, but it's not immediately obvious why. It's a ban on bonuses when you kill. What does that even mean? Well, some features in the game give players a boost when they kill or attack a creature. The Blood Spear, for example, gives you 2d6 temporary hit points when you reduce a creature to zero hit points with it. So if you were to say, I don't know, buy a sack full of chickens, you could murder one each morning to start the day with 2d6 temporary hit points. That's a pretty decent buff for free, especially as you can just hand the spear to each player in turn and everyone can kill a chicken for the free temporary hit points. At low levels, this is really good, but this type of ability really goes crazy when you start actively comboing it. I won't go into the full thing here, but there is a combo you can pull off as a Dampier Swords Bard at level three. Basically, you use one of your flourishes to make a bite attack that deals extra damage to every creature within five feet of you. Surround yourself with fireflies or something, and you can effectively do hundreds of points of damage this way. And the Dampier feature lets you regain hit points equal to the damage you deal with that attack. It also lets you add the damage you dealt to your next ability check or attack roll, potentially giving you a boost in the hundreds to your persuasion or deception checks. The full breakdown on that ridiculous combo is in this video if you want to hear more. All you really need to know is that abilities that activate when you kill a creature are completely busted when you just carry around a jar of cockroaches and murder one whenever you need a boost. And this is just banned. Like, it's they don't even end entertain it for a second. There's just a hard rule, livestock and other similar creatures don't activate on kill bonuses. Considering how crazy this seemingly completely innocent ability is, it makes a lot of sense. Okay, so here's the final combo. Let's see what mental thing the Forged Concordance has banned this time. Polymorph. You can't polymorph into a T-Rex. Wait, what? I, I mean, that that's not that powerful. I mean, the T-Rex is good, but... 
the giant ape is arguably better. What's going on here? Okay, I'll explain. The Forge Concordance Westmarch server takes place in an original world. It's an original setting, and in that setting, there just aren't any dinosaurs. And that is okay. Honestly, it's a fine reason to ban something in D&D if it just doesn't fit into the type of story you are all trying to create. Something doesn't have to be broken for it to not be perfect, and as long as the expectations are very clearly set out ahead of time so players know what they can and can't do, that's cool. Every server, every game table, every fantasy world will have a few things like this. It's just sort of a side effect of playing with other people. I put it in here because it's important to remember that d and is a storytelling game, and there can be story-based reasons for things not being allowed. And if you really want to do something that the GM was initially a bit more hesitant about, you can just ask. You can have a mature discussion. You never know, things might change. Because in truth, the dinosaur ban was lifted from the Forge Concordance earlier this year. That's right, baby. Dinosaurs are back. Power level 10 million, Jurassic Park, let's go. It should go without saying that most of these combos are banned for good reason. Look, I, I love them. I love busted combos. I think they're funny and they're good thought experiments. But in actual practice, most broken combos are kind of boring. Like, once you've broken the game, there's kind of nowhere left to go. So don't bring them to your games without at least discussing it with your DM first. Maybe if you're running a crazy meme game, it's fine. But most of the time, it's better to just not do this stuff. Or if you're a DM, just steal these rules and use them in your game. I mean, it's a pretty decent ban list, honestly. Also, Ryoko's Guide to the Yokai Realms is out right now for playtesting. If you miss the main campaign and want access to the book immediately in its beta test form to leave feedback and influence the final thing, you can. Just head over to the Ryoko's Guide Kickstarter page, I've linked it down below, where you can pre-order the book and get playtesting right away. Okay, this year was crazy, huh? Remember to like and subscribe, check out other videos on the channel, and yeah, that's all I got. I'll see you next time.